What is up guys and welcome back to the channel. Now last episode we went ahead and installed some spoon lowering springs on the Honda Civic Type R FL5 and today's episode we're going to be doing a comprehensive detailed analysis of the spoon springs and how it affects the Honda Civic Type R FL5. We're going to be talking about the cost, alignment specs, ride comfort, OEM ride height versus spoon springs ride height, and installation strategies and tactics. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right guys, one last look at the Honda Civic Type R FL5 on OEM suspension. So let's go ahead and pull some measurements on the rear fender to the ground and the front fender to the ground. And we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison once we're done installing the spoon springs. Let's go ahead and pull some dimensions. Okay, so on the front side from the ground up to the top of the center fender, we're looking right about 26 and 3 8 Let's go ahead and check the rear. In the rear side measurements from the ground up to the top of the rear fender, we're looking about 26 and 1 8 Okay, now that the spoon springs have been on the Honda Civic Type R FL5 for a few weeks and after alignment, let's go ahead and pull some measurements. Okay, so start with the front from the ground up to the top edge of the front fender. I'm coming up with 25 and about 9 16 And regarding the rear measurement, up from the ground up to the top edge of the rear fender, I'm coming up with 25 and 3 8 Now considering the rear measurement is 25 and 3 8 and the front is at 25 9 16 that's 3 16 of an inch difference right there. So for whatever reason, Honda always has the rear fender lower than the front. And Spoon, I guess, just wants to do an even lowering, I guess, with the way the engineer of springs. I know some people go to Swift Springs or Ebok Springs. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Ebok, Ibok, I'm not sure. But anyhow, I guess some people want a more even drop on the fender, even if the car has like a rear rake to it. All right, guys, I'm going to be doing a lot of filming inside the car today simply because of the fact that it's very windy out. So... I think this will achieve better, you know, volume clarity for you guys watch on the computer. Okay, let's go ahead and dive into the cost of what these spoon springs cost, where I bought them from, and what the shipping charges were. So essentially, I bought these from a company called Blackhawk Japan, and those that are not familiar with that company, basically it's a JDM parts supplier located straight in Japan, and they'll ship straight over the United States. Anyhow, the cost of the spoon springs over at Blackhawk was $354 and I paid $109 shipping. Now, just for comparison purposes, if you guys want to go ahead and purchase from Spoon Sports USA, they've got those springs listed on their website for $550, and then shipping charges was $72. It puts them at $622 for the springs and the shipping combined. Now, if you guys are looking to save some money, you know, just go ahead and order from Blackhawk Japan, even though I did have to wait about 10 days for them to gather all my parts and then ship it over to the United States, which I think only took about three days for shipping itself. Um, I ordered some other parts such as spoon oil filters, uh, spoon magnetic oil drain bolts, and some JDM illumination parts, which we'll do another video on that later. So anyhow, $463 shipped from Blackhawk Japan versus Spoon Sports USA at $622. Now, comparing the prices of springs themselves, not including shipping, so Swift Springs, $350, Ibox Springs, $350, and Spoon Sport Springs from Black Hawk Japan, $354. So they're right in line if you order from Black Hawk Japan compared to the Swift Springs and Ibox Springs over here in the United States. But if you were to order the Spoon Springs from Spoon Sports USA, that's $550 compared to Swift and Ibox both at $350, so it's $200 more over there in states. So essentially, I paid $463 shipped for my Spoon Sport Springs from Blackhawk Japan. Okay, let's go ahead and switch topics over to alignment. So essentially, I let these springs settle for about two weeks before I went ahead and seeked out alignment shop, which I had a challenge doing. So my typical alignment shop, they specialize in lowered cars and lifted trucks, but they took a look at the front lip and how low was the ground, and they didn't want to take any chances, you know, getting this thing on the ramp and potentially damaging their front lips. So I couldn't take it there. I uh, went into two other shops and one shop was actually trying to pull one over on me saying that sensors need to be recalibrated of some sort for an extra $150, $200. I'm like, 
what are you guys talking about? There's no sensors that need to be recalibrated. I want you to just basically do the alignment and that's it. So, uh, I mean, they were just trying to do a money grab on me and they said that since it was custom alignment, it was gonna be $250. So like, this is a little absurd because basically you just drove straight ahead into the garage and that's where they did alignments. So most shops actually have a rack where you have to drive up an angle and onto the actual metal rack. But that wasn't the case for the shop. So I went and passed on that one and I went ahead and went on the Facebook groups and asked around and there was this one shop that was reputable and they basically specialize in German cars. So I went ahead and gave them a call, made an appointment, and about two hours later, I had an alignment done. Now, one thing to note is the tow-in was off, obviously, because whenever you start messing with a car suspension, you know, all the settings and whatnot, it's gonna really throw everything off between the camber and the tow. So in my opinion, the most important thing is dialing that tow-in back, because if you've got your tires pointing in front direction like that, it's basically gonna wear the outside edges of the tires real quick. And I learned my lesson from my RSX when I replaced front lower control arms. And I basically burned out the front tires in about maybe 1,500 miles or so. So anyways, the front camber on the front tires, it's still a little bit on the high side. I think one's like a negative 1.7. Another one's like a negative 1.4. But what really wears out tires in alignment is basically your toe. So if your tires are not towed in correctly, it's going to wear them out from what I've read. So that's just what I've read and doing my research. I mean, negative 1.7 and was it negative 1.4? I don't think that's too bad, but if it's like a negative three or negative five, you know, that's bad. And especially the guys, you know, the stance cars with the heavy camber, you know, I think that's definitely gonna wear your tires. That's just my opinion. So anyways, I guess you can resolve that with some adjustable lower ball joints, or you can get some adjustable top hats which actually replaces the top hats, the factory ones on OEM springs, and you replace it with the aftermarket ones. And I believe it's got four Allen head screws and there's a big slot. So you can basically undo those screws and loosen it up and you can shift the uh, entire strut assembly, you know, outwards or inwards. So I haven't decided if I'm gonna take that approach yet, but I'm happy with how the car rides right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and pay attention to any tire wear just to make sure Okay, so while we're on the topic of alignment, let me go ahead and pop the hood and show you what's going on with the top part of the strut assembly. Let's go ahead and open the hood up. Okay, so taking a closer look at the strut towers under the hood, let's go ahead and disregard the strut bar, but anyhow, you got the three bolts that hold the top strut assembly in place. And then on the back side right here, you got this alignment pin. So I didn't know about this information until after alignment. Now I believe removing this pin right here and loosen up these bolts Will give you the potential for an extra negative three degrees of camber adjustment and i think that's for like racing applications because when you're on a racetrack you want more negative camber than you do positive so i'm not sure if this is negative only or if it's positive so if you guys know the answer please feel free to comment below so basically i just want to show you guys this alignment pin that's on the top strut tire right here it's on the car so you can remove this thing, and it'll give you a little bit more of adjustment, but I'm not sure if this is negative three or positive three. Okay, let's go and talk about the installation techniques in order to install spoon springs on the Honda Civic Top Rail FL5. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw the last video that I did, but anyhow, the rear springs, you essentially undo two bolts and you slowly lower down the control arm and the, basically the spring just drops right down. And then in order to reinstall it, basically just replace the rubber boots, put it back in position, jack it up, put the bolts in, torque the spec, and you're all done. Now, regarding the front assembly, it is very tough compared to the rear. Rear is a cakewalk, front is a whole different ball game. So essentially what makes the front the toughest is separating the knuckle assembly from the strut tube. So once you undo all the bolts from knuckle assembly, basically you need to take pry bars, pry it, and I was actually shaking on the front rotor, you know, trying to jiggle it off. And I think there is one special tool someone told me to take a look at. I think it's like a spreader tool of some sort. So I think what you do is you put in the slit right behind the knuckle assembly. You take a wrench and tighten it up. And I think it'll open up the opening so you can get that strut tube a little bit more movement in there. So I wanna go ahead and give recognition where recognition is due. My neighbor for helping me with the front driver's side and my friend Wes for helping me with the front passenger side. So without those two guys, I probably would have been still struggling with that thing because it's not fun. And I think it's a two-man operation doing the front suspension on the FL5. That's just my personal opinion. So just go ahead and take your time, 
undoing the front suspension and once you get it out you know you're halfway there getting it back in can be tricky as well so just have a friend to actually help push down on the rotor assembly that actually help out a lot but if you don't have a friend you know it's going to be tough because i mean there's just a lot of tension going on with that front suspension assembly and make sure you torque everything to spec when you put everything back together that's very important don't skimp on that so my best piece of advice on the front suspension disassembly is basically just take your time make sure you got the right tools such as the pry bars or maybe the spreader tool and hopefully the strut tube will come out a lot easier from the knuckle assembly than it did for me but just go ahead and use caution and as always always use personal protective gear okay moving on to the topic that everyone wants to hear how does the spoon springs ride on the honda civic type rfl5 so let's go ahead and start with the r mode i don't do r mode very often that basically stiffens up the dampers to full hardness that's basically meant for a racetrack so I've only had that on for about maybe two, three times since I've owned the car, so it is still very stiff in that mode. And then moving on to sport mode. So sport mode, it's a little bit more stiffer than the OEM comfort setting. I guess it's the best way to put it. So I don't drive on the highway on sport mode because whenever I do that, I feel that the car has a little bit of bounce to it. So I don't like that. So I don't ride very often in sport mode. I usually just cruise in comfort mode. So let's go ahead and talk about comfort mode. So comfort mode with the OEM FL5 springs, I was very contempt with. I was getting used to it. So I actually liked the ride quality with the OEM springs on the FL5 Type R. So that's kind of the reason why I wanted to go with spoon springs because I've heard some mixed reviews with Eibach and Swift Springs of being too harsh of a ride, you know, with the comfort mode and I did not want to do that. So I wanted to go as close to OEM as possible or maybe an improvement. So I think that spoon actually achieves that. So in order to answer your question, the spoon springs rides phenomenal on comfort mode. So it actually improves the ride quality. So if you guys are looking to do the Integra Type S damper control module and spend what 200 to 300 bucks for that little box, don't even waste your money. Just go ahead and get yourself some spoon lowering springs. You're gonna lower the car. You're gonna improve the ride quality. So you're basically killing two birds with one stone right there. But it's up to you. If you wanna retain you know, a factory ride height, you know, go ahead and do the Integra Type S damper control module. That's entirely up to you, but I'm very happy with how these spoon springs turned out on the FL5 Type R. If I had to do it all over again, I'd definitely reinstall these springs, even though the installation is a pain in the butt, but it's all worth it at the end of the day. So if you're on the fence of whether or not to get the spoon springs for your FL5 Type R or maybe your FK8, I would definitely recommend these springs. It doesn't lower the car too much. You know, it basically gets rid of most of the wheel gap. So you still have a little bit of height, I guess, between the fender and the tire. So you're not worrying about scraping every single place that you drive to. So I know the Swift Springs or the Eibach Springs will look awesome, you know, with very minimal wheel gap between the fender and the tire. But to me, that's just not very practical. So that's one of the reasons I went with these Spoon Springs because it's a moderate drop. And on top of that, Spoon Sports knows exactly what they're doing when they're engineering parts for Honda automobiles. So just to reiterate, if you have the suspension on comfort mode, this thing is gonna ride a lot better than what the OEM FL5 springs have. And I think that's due in part because there's more coils per linear inch than there is with the OEM FL5 springs. That's just how Spoon engineered it. They also are a little bit heavier than the OEM springs, just a little tidbit. So I hope that this answers all your questions of how the Spoon Sports ride on the FL5 Type R. Long story short, phenomenal, better ride quality than the OEM FL5 springs. So if you're on the fence, just go ahead and get these springs. You'll have no regrets. All right, let me go ahead and get everyone's input. What's everyone's thoughts on the stance right here with the spoon springs? Or do you think I show one with the Swift springs or the Eibach springs? Let me know in the comments below. I'll be happy to hear what you guys have to say. All righty, guys. That wraps up the detailed analysis of the Spoon Sport springs for the Honda Civic Type R FL5. Now, if you guys are on the fence of whether or not to install some Spoon Sport Springs on your FL5 or FK8, just go ahead and do yourself a favor, pick some up, you're definitely going to be happy. I mean, just look at the way this thing sits, and best of all, this thing rides 
better than OEM springs, surprisingly. Anyhow, if you got any specific questions on the Spoon Sport Springs, feel free to comment below. And if you guys found this video helpful or entertaining, please give me a thumbs up. Thanks for watching and have a fantastic day.